Welcome to our lesson on invertebrates. Today's lesson 3-4 will be focusing on mollusks and worms. So let's go ahead and dive right in. So the main body adaption for this group of organisms and the leading up to it is the creation of a gut, otherwise known as a coelom. So the question is, have you got the guts? And the inner cavity, or gut, as it is called, is called the coelom. That is C-O-E-L-O-M, pronounced coelom. The creation of a coelom is an incredibly important advancement. It allows for the creation of organs and internal digestion. Without a true coelom, we could not have a digestive system. Without a digestive system, larger, more advanced animals could not have been evolved. Animals without an inner body cavity is called an a -coelomate. Remember, a is a prefix that means without. Okay, so anytime you see a science word that has a as a prefix, that typically will mean without. Animals with a partial inner cavity or false inner cavity is called a pseudo -coelomate. So organism with no body cavity, no inner cavity, is a -coelomate. Those with a partial inner cavity or false inner cavity is called a pseudo -coelomate. And an animal with a true inner body cavity is called a -coelomate. Okay. Let's dive into our first a -coelomate organism that has just one advancement, truly, above their relatives the cnidarians. These platyhelminthes, which is how you pronounce this word here, is our next phylum. So remember, porifera were sponges, cnidarians were uh, either a jellyfish, a coral, or a sea anemone. Those are phylums, and platyhelminthes is also a phylum. This phylum contains all of the flatworms, and they look anything like the parasitic tapeworm to this really beautiful worm to this planaria, okay? And you can see the big adaptation here is called bilateral symmetry. The platyhelminthes, or flatworms, were the first organisms on our planet to display bilateral symmetry. And what does that mean? Bilateral means I can cut the organism one way to get equal halves on either side. So this side is equal to this side just like we are, we have bilateral symmetry, okay? Unlike a cnidaria, which has radial symmetry, and unlike a sponge, who has no symmetry at all, organisms, and animals specifically, starting with the platyhelminthes or flatworms, will see bilateral symmetry. That is their big, big adaptation. Now, you may be wondering, well, why are all these worms flat? Why don't they have a body? Well, one, they don't have a body cavity, so they can't be round. Um, and they can't create organs because there is no room, because there is no body cavity. And they actually need to be flat because one way that they respire is through diffusion. And being flat gives you a very large surface area so that you can diffuse or have more room to diffuse things. Okay? So that is the platyhelminthes. Moving up on our trip of the animal kingdom. We have the nematodes or nematoda. These are our round worms and nematoda is the phylum for round worms. Their big advancement is the first organisms where we start to see pseudo coelomates or partial body cavities. Okay, They are mostly parasitic and they include organisms such as the hookworms and heartworms. And just remember that earthworms are not roundworms. They are something else. They are that third type okay, uh, of worm, which we will talk about in our next lecture. But for now, just know that roundworms, nematoda, are pseudocelomates, which means they have a false body cavity or a partial body cavity. They're mostly parasitic, and some examples are hookworms and heartworms. Now moving into the mollusks. The mollusks are the first organisms on our planet, and this is the phylum mollusca. And mollusca, 
Okay, so the mollusks are the first organisms on our planet to show a true gut, a true body cavity, the coelomates. Okay, so a true coelom are mollusks. The development of highly organized tissues, such as organs. So when you are a coelomate, you have a body cavity or coelom, which allows for the development of specialized organs. And this is important because now we can develop a true digestive system. Okay. Some notable features of your mollusks is they have a radula, which is their tongue. Okay. It is a barbed tongue for grabbing and tearing food. They have a foot or a siphon or tentacles for locomotion. So in the snail here, we have a foot and it's the sticky part that goes on the ground and that's how they move. Uh, another example would be for a octopus has tentacles and they move through jet propulsion. Okay. And then we have the mantle, which will produce shells in our hard-shelled mollusks. And the mantle is this part, in case you didn't know. There are three main classes of mollusks. They are broken up into bivalves. So these are clams and oysters, represented here by SpongeBob inside of a clam. There are two halves. Okay, so bi is two and two halves, clams and oysters. Then we have our gastropods. Our gastropods are this little guy, snails and slugs. They have a foot that lets them for motion and they have a, um, a stomach. And then we have our cephalopods and those are our, they have big brains, they also have a foot and these animals are squid and octopi. Okay, so squid and octopus would be in the class cephalopods, and they swim via jet propulsion, which is pretty cool. Although instead of pushing jet fuel, you're pushing seawater. Our geek of the week this week is Tsunemi Kubodera, and he is a Japanese zoologist who in 2004 was the very first man to videotape a live giant squid. So that is pretty cool. He's holding the beak right now of a giant squid. So he was born in 1951 in Nakano, Japan, and he was the first man to videotape one of these guys, live giant squid. Now these guys can be up to 43 feet long, and they have an infamous uh, place in history, such as the Kraken from those Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Now obviously the myth of Kraken goes back much further than those movies. Um, in the, I don't know when the movie came out, and I forget even further when the book came out, but 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea was a brilliant book and it came out a while ago and it was the the main villain of that was a giant squid and obviously we've had some stories about them in new zealand so how did he find them well he had to look at some clues and the earliest known information were the beaks that he found or not he but other scientists found in the stomachs of whales and now you may be wondering why did we look at stomachs of whales and well back in the early 1900s whaling was hugely popular almost to the brink of extinction which is why you have the whole save the whale campaigns out there they have the largest known eye sizes uh, of any cephalopod which are octopi or squid and they can be as large as dinner plates and you would have dead organisms or dead representatives of these squids wash up in australia all the time and at one point it was spotted in the Atlantic Ocean. So he followed the clues, he got, in a or he got into a submersible and he started to film. And then lo and behold, later on, they found an even bigger species of squid called the colossal squid. And it can be found in deep water around Antarctica and it can measure up to 59 feet long and almost 1100 pounds. That's 60 feet. Look in your house, most large rooms in a house are under 30 feet long, let alone 60 feet long. So as of current science, the 59 foot long colossal squid is the largest invertebrate on record. And that will do it for our 3-4 lesson. For those of you playing along at home, our Video secret number will just be audio this time because obviously my presentation died on me. Uh, the video secret number for this presentation is going to be 41. 41 is your video secret number. Thanks so much for listening, guys, and I'll talk to you soon.